Welcome, uh, Mike, to uh, the Graduate Institute. Let me start with your last book, uh, Ordinary Virtues, uh, because I was wondering, for, uh, f the book comes as a bit of a surprise to someone who knows how much you have written on human rights. And uh, suddenly, the last book is making an argument, not against human rights, but for ordinary virtues of compassion, of trust, of solidarity, and um, saying that the language of human rights may have been the language of elites rather than of ordinary people. So could you say something about this surprising turn in your thinking? Right. Look, I've been teaching human rights for decades and think a world would be a much poorer place unless we had a basic universal language that says, this is the stuff you should never do to another human being, period. And I think there's a lot of universal support around the world for do not murder, do not torture, do not deprive of fundamental legal and other rights. And then there's a lot of arguments about what else you put in that package. So none of what I'm saying now is against that basic idea. The world would be more dangerous and poor if we didn't have universal human rights. What, what the book says is that if you then ask a different question, you go into a favela or a poor shanty town in South Africa and you ask people, do you kind of use human rights to defend yourself or is human rights part of your moral understanding? They don't know what you're talking about. So in that sense, I think human rights is an elite discourse, and I'm glad that the elite discourse is there. But we have to take account of the enormous gulf between the elite discourse and what I call the ordinary virtues. Um, and the ordinary virtues have a particular moral character which is very different from human rights. Human rights is universal. Ordinary virtues is I care about my own, my own people. I care about the people around me. I don't accept universal obligations. And there's a huge strain, I think, in the modern world between elites who think in universal terms and ordinary people who think in very particularistic terms and have loyalties that are very particularistic. And this is one of the explosive conflicts of our time. So if I pick up two points that you've just made and take them to a different uh, domain on which you've also written and spoken about a lot, um, partly because you've had to uh, battle against um, uh, right-wing populism. Um, but uh, the two points I'd like to pick up are the idea of universalism as something which is part of the uh, problem that the West uh, has um, exported with its liberalism. So there is a liberal hubris to this um, universal uh, or the export of universalism and that populism could be seen in a sense as a backlash, um, a reaction um, and a resentment uh, against that, as well as a politics of nostalgia for something lost. Absolutely. There is a revolt against universalism. It takes very specific forms. In Hungary, where I work and live, it takes the form of a government saying, don't tell us what the rule of law is. Don't tell us what's good for Hungarians. We were elected by the people to decide what's good for Hungarians. And we don't think your university should be in Hungary, period. Right? And that's localism with a vengeance. Anti-universal in the sense that if you come back to them and say, what about academic freedom? They say, what are you talking about? We decide what should be taught in Hungary, and you don't fit the program. Um, so clearly, I'm someone who wants to have a strong pan-European defense of a universal value like academic freedom. But I also want to have a politics which understands that countries want a say, they want control over fundamental questions of international life. I'm a kind of believer in sovereignty, political sovereignty. That is, I think people ought to have the right to choose their own way, but I think it all, always ought to be limited by universal commitments. Uh, because if you don't limit it by universal commitments, you end up with kind of authoritarian, provincial, 
uh, exclusive, exclusionary politics that is damaging to the country, but also dangerous for your neighbors. So part of the problem, I think, here is at the reassertion of popular sovereignty comes because people feel threatened by the lack of economic sovereignty. Don't you think part of the populist backlash is a reaction to neoliberalism, the feeling that one has no economic control over one's own life? I think to some degree that's true. But if I think about Hungary, what's so interesting is Hungary is a populist, sovereignist, reactionary, nationalist regime that is 100% integrated into the German multinational empire. So there's a case where you have populism which is only too happy to be uh, as cozy as possible with BMW, Daimler, and you know, Audi and all these guys. And in fact, Hungary is happy to be a low wage platform for German industry. And that works for the local authoritarian elite. And it's providing rising real wages for many Hungarians. So um, I think there's a kind of phony have your cake and eat it too. That is, these populist regimes say, we want to control, we want sovereignty, but they're only too happy, frankly, to sell out to Economic large sovereignty. scale multinationals. They want political sovereignty, but are happy to trade economic sovereignty. Well, that's interesting. And it's, it's a political brew that may be contradictory, but it's pretty successful at the moment. And the other aspect of it which you uh, picked on is the nationalism, the nationalist ideology. Now, for liberals, I think there is a real problem here because if uh, liberal principles are universal, where do I set the limits? to my liberalism and the application of these principles. So somehow liberalism needs a nation state as a whole, a liberal society does, and yet its principles would not allow you to exclude on any basis. Mm. I think that's right. I, I, I always remember those wonderful things in the Declaration of Independence in 1776 about a country the United States staging a rebellion against imperial power. Uh, it's, it's a national patriotic revolt against empire. And Jefferson says we need to pay decent respect to the opinions of mankind. That is, so you want to have a national project. You want to have sovereignty over your basic political community. But you feel you owe an account to other people beyond their borders. In other words, Jefferson is trying to marry, you know, national patriotic creation of a political community with some obligation to be consistent with the rules of international law and international comity and, and good relations with her. It's not a vision of national patriotism which is shut off from the rest of the world. And that, it seems to me, is what we're all trying to find, the sweet spot where you have national political sovereignty, um, control over the terms and conditions of your national life, but you're also part of a global community and you accept some universal obligations not to abuse and hurt and humiliate other people, which is where human rights comes in. But these are exactly the kinds of um, attitudes, uh, sentiments, um, which in a sense a liberal citizen um, should um, espouse. And the problem is liberals are not born, they have to be made. <laughs> <laughs> and the question yeah. would be how to make liberal citizens yeah. in a world which is- Well, that brings us to the Graduate Institute in Geneva and my university. We're in the business of producing not in the business of producing liberals, um, since we may produce conservatives and socialists and communists and anarchists and whatever, but we do want to produce citizens. We want to produce people who are reflective about the terms and conditions of political allegiance and political belonging, and we want them to go out and teach other people. So, yeah, none of the, your point is none of this is natural. All of it has to be taught and learned, and that's why I'm happy to do my job as an academic. Thank you very much. <laughs>